Worst attacks of terror since 9-11, since 26-11, those massacres and that absolutely shocking brutality that was displayed by members of Hamas as they entered Israel uh, a week ago and the devastation and the havoc that they caused. This is going to be a particularly important issue, not just for the world, but also for India, because India, of course, has very close strategic relationships with many Arab countries and historic relations with them, but also increasingly important strategic relations with Israel. Immediately after the terror attack, Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted his support uh, for Israel and all week long there's been an absolute outpouring of emotional support for Israel after that terror attack from Indians, not just in India, but from Indians around the world. But at the same time, there are other questions also that need to be taken a look at. Uh, there's the immediate question. Yes, of course, Israel needs to be supported. Yes, of course, Israel has the, the right to defend itself after that horrific terror attack. But what is that response going to be? As Hamas is taken out in Gaza Strip, what happens to innocent civilians, innocent people in Gaza? Um, how do you minimize casualties? How do you make sure that they are safe? What impact will that 24-hour deadline actually have? Those questions need to be taken uh, a look at. And then there are the broader questions which have now started to be reflected even from the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. The longer-term solution, the fact that... Uh, Netanyahu's policies may not have always been the right ones when it comes to lasting peace, the concept of a, of a two-state solution and how that can possibly be implemented. Now, of course, the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian questions is not something that's going to happen right now, and perhaps it's not even the right time to actually be discussing it. But yes, the immediate question has to be taken a look at. How can Hamas be taken out? How can Hamas be dealt with? How can Hamas perhaps be punished for what it has done in Israel? But at the same time, how can innocent civilians be protected in the Gaza Strip? And how can we not have an unnecessary loss of civilian life? Those are tricky questions. And over the course of the next one hour, we're going to be turning our attention to all of them. And we're going to be speaking to some of the top experts from across the board. We're going to be joined by Prof. Hassan Nahum, the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. We're going to be joined by the Palestinian Ambassador to India, Adnan uh, al Haija. We are going to be speaking to Lieutenant Colonel Mordechai uh, Kedar, who's a former intelligence officer at the IDF, who's going to be talking to us about possible intelligence failure. The Red Cross and the Red Crescent are going to be really crucial in whatever happens now in the Gaza Strip. And Tommaso Del Longa, the spokesperson uh, for the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, are going to be joining us. Mr. T.S. Timurthy, former ambassador of India to the United Nations, is going to be talking to us about Indian policies. Jonah Bank, a former foreign advisor to the American President Joe Biden, is going to be giving us the international perspective and a view from Washington. And Anath Bernstein Reich, uh, President of the Israel Asia and the Chair of the Israel India Chambers of Commerce, is going to be joining us finally to wrap up the entire show. So, a range of experts are going to be with us in the next one hour. And let me now welcome the first of the special guests we have for you today, Flor Hassan Nahum, joining us now, the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Flor, thank you so much for joining us. And I have to say, all of our thoughts have really been with you and with everyone else there in Israel after those absolutely terrible terror attacks. Now, how are people holding up? I'm, I mean, there's been such a large loss of life, one of the most horrific terror attacks ever. Absolutely. In the history of the state of Israel, there's never been uh, an attack of, in, on civilians of this scale and of this brutality. And we spent the first two days in trauma and disbelief. Uh, and then slowly we are going into action. So civil society is very strong in this country. So people are helping the bereaved, helping the families of the hostages, helping bring food to soldiers, helping provide uh, shelter for the people from the South. For example, here in Jerusalem, I just came from an event with women from the South. Anything that we can do. And so the mood has changed from trauma to resilience to defiance. Flo, you know, people sometimes don't realize just how small a country Israel is in terms of population. So that means a lot of people would actually know people.
who were killed or taken hostage. This is not India <laughs> yeah. with a billion and a half people. We, um, we are a country of less than 10 million people and everybody's been affected. Everybody knows somebody that I've got a friend whose son is um, a hostage. I've got a friend whose daughter's boyfriend was killed. My daughter is in the army and one of the friends of her, of course, was killed by a rocket. It is, I can't tell you the anguish that we're going through right now. I can't describe to you how, um, you know, I, I know you, you can't really compare, but we're getting a little bit of, of a taste of what the Holocaust was because the brutality of the killings, the things we're discovering every single day, the scale of the pain. I Look, I, I came here 22 years ago in the middle of the second intifada and that was painful and there were buses being blown up and cafes being blown up. But for some reason, and this was in Jerusalem, but for some reason this feels so much worse. Now, following the period since then, it, we're starting to get more information on what actually happened. Obviously, there was an intelligence failure of mammoth pr pr proportions, uh, but details are starting to emerge on how they were able to get inside and how this terror attack was, was carried out. Uh, what can you tell us? Yes, so what we know so far is that 1,500 terrorists uh, broke through the barrier um, and basically went into the... Um, the kibbutzes and the villages of the south of Israel went uh, looking for innocents, civilians. They did not want to deal with the army. They're cowards. And they went house to house slaughtering people. I mean slaughtering people. I mean cutting them up, burning them up, throwing um, grenades into shelters, killing old women in their beds, beheading uh, babies and children, burning them alive, you name it. These are scenes of ISIS, Boko Haram, you name it. And, and every day we discover something new in what was a huge trauma um, and huge atrocities and, you know, uh, just atrocities of war that have happened down in the South. And we never, I think we're, a lot of us are in disbelief that we never thought this would happen in our country. War is war. And we had 50 years ago a war that caught us by surprise, the Yom Kippur War. And the majority of the dead were combatants. That's what happens in war. The majority of the dead here are civilians. And, and these people came to target them. They came to target civilians, they're cowards. And they took 150 back with them. Uh, my, my friend's son lost an arm. They shot it off and now he's in Gaza. And, and God knows what medical attention, if any, he's getting. And so he's also if, even if they manage to get him out, his life could be, um, you know, at risk because he's not getting medical attention. So I can't begin to tell you the feeling that we have right now here of trauma and, um, and anger and sadness. Yes, Florian, I can tell you that even from here in India, uh, there's been such an uh, outpouring of support. Perhaps it's uh, the grief of sharing also, because in India also there have been terror attacks that so many people have, have actually experienced and gone through. So there's that sense uh, of sharing that pain. Uh, but you can't help feeling that the terrorists were also, through all of those horrific brutalities, yes. were trying to instigate something, probably trying to instigate a certain reaction. And that, I'm sure, is something that even there in Israel, uh, you've got to be thinking about what were they trying to do. They were pr probably trying to have a breakdown of negotiations, talks between Saudi Arabia and Israel, trying to maybe provoke a certain reaction against civilian uh, uh, populations that will lead to a fresh harvest uh, of hatred. Um, uh, clearly, there, will, there, will, there were certain things that Hamas was trying to instigate. You know, Vikram, it's not a secret that their charter says that they want the destruction of the state of Israel. These are not people who want some type of peaceful resolution with us. At any point, it's in their charter that they want the destruction of Israel. They want to kill all Jews here and everywhere around the world. That's in their charter. This is what they teach their children from the moment that they're born. And so they came to kill. They came to get a, a, um, a victory um, and, of course, create a reaction. And the reaction is that Israel goes in. They knew that that was going to happen and either booby trap and kill more soldiers or make that point, or like you, you quite rightly say, I think part of it here is to derail the continuation of the normalization of Israel with the rest of the Arab world. You know, Fleur, when you're looking at this from the outside, and when you're hearing those reports of the absolutely horrific brutalities that were carried out by the terrorists after they had uh, entered Israel, you can't help by thinking that 
they almost were deliberately inflicting horrors in that particular manner. It seemed to be almost designed to make Israelis so angry that they would strike back with everything they had on Gaza in temper, and then you would have pictures emerging out of Gaza um, that are what the sort of pictures we're starting to see now, which then puts Israel in a certain light as well. So is, is that something you've got that's to keep in mind? Game. Exactly. This is what's going to happen now. Now, that's they're where the is. now they're crying humanitarian crisis because we've cut off uh, the electricity, etc. And you're right. And they don't care for their people because if they cared for their people, then they wouldn't want the reaction that they're going to get from Israel. But the truth is, Vikram, I don't think they thought they were going to be so successful. And that's what's shocking here. What on earth happened for this to happen? What failed? And we're not talking about this now because we're too busy with the war effort and we're too busy yeah. healing the people that survived and we're too busy burying bodies. My friends are volunteering to dig graves. This is what's happening right now. People are volunteering for everything. My friends are digging graves in Tel Aviv. And so the point is that I actually, they did want a reaction. I think they didn't understand how successful they would be, and there would be a lot of questions asked of what happened here, but not now, after the war is over. I think you're right that there are questions that are going to have to be uh, answered after the war is over. The question of, you know, of course, post-mortems on whether there was an intelligence failure, how were they able to get inside, what actually happened to Israel's much-wanted in intelligence system. And then there's the longer-term question. I remember even when I was in Jerusalem in March talking to you, standing in front of Al-Aqsa, we were having a debate that, you know, uh, what are the policies that should be followed, how can you take the Palestinians along, could there be terror uh, attacks? So those are questions, and you're right, there will be a time to, to answer those questions. But I think there's one question that I have to ask you which has to be addressed immediately, and that's a question that is also being asked by well-wishers of Israel and friends of Israel that, look, whatever happened in that shocking terror attack, how should Israel be dealing with Gaza right now uh, in a manner that civilians aren't targeted and they're not massive civilian casualties because that's not necessarily in Israel's own interest. If those sort of images are coming out, it could perhaps achieve exactly what Hamas wants to achieve. Of course. Well, listen, as a mother, I, believe me, the last thing, there's not one Israeli here who would celebrate the death of Palestinian children. We weren't educated that way. Humanitarianism here comes first. Um, but ultimately, we are a moral army. We warn people before we level buildings. How many armies do that in the middle of a brutal war? We actually send messages to the residents in the buildings to leave. And what everybody is not talking about, Vikram, is why on earth does Egypt not open a humanitarian corridor? They border Gaza. They have a border with Gaza. They are you know, their fellow Muslims and Arabs from the region. And just like Europe opened their doors to Ukraine during this war, well, why don't they just open the, 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 the frontier? Why is it all on Israel? Why should the victim have to continue to help and aid the aggressor? Tell me that. I, you know, if not, I understand. I understand where the anger comes from. And quite frankly, as I said, India has been the victim of terrorism uh, perhaps more than any other country, so we, we, un, we, we know what it feels like. I, I guess the fundamental question is that as now you're talking about 24-hour deadlines and other things and moving people around in Gaza, dealing with, the, with, with, with I think there is a question of the policies that will have to be followed now there. Nobody here wants the death of innocence, Vikram. That's the difference between us and the terrorists in Gaza. Nobody okay. wants the death of innocence. And the army does. The army puts itself at risk and goes house to house in order not to create too many innocent deaths. Because the easiest thing for Israel would be to carpet bomb Gaza the way that the Allies carpet bombed Dresden during the Second World War in order to win. And many German innocent people, I'm sure, died also there. And so we are a moral army. We have to stand proud of the way that we fight because we put ourselves at risk in order to save innocents on the other side. We care more about their children than they do. 
All right, Phil, we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. Let, let's see how it actually pans out. Our thoughts as I began by saying are clearly with you and with everybody else there. People who've lost uh, loved ones uh, to these absolutely horrendous uh, uh, terror attacks. And of course, there's still so many people, hostages, I'm sure that's one of the, the things that will be uppermost in everyone's mind. How do you get the hostages back? Look, I'm not a, a military expert. I don't know what they will do. But the longer we wait, the, the worse it's going to be. So I just pray that our military extract them or even negotiate if we have to. We just have to get those people out of there. All right, Phil, thank you so much for joining us.